book of Exodus chapter 17 Exodus chapter 17 and I want to preach a piece of a sermon in process if y'all don't mind tonight I'd like to begin reading at verse number 8 I'm reading from the English standard version of the Bible Exodus 17, beginning at verse 8, here's what the word of the Lord says. Then Amalek came and fought with Israel at Rephidim. So Moses said to Joshua, choose for us men and go out and fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the staff of God in my hand. Joshua did as Moses told him and fought with Amalek while Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. Whenever Moses held up his hand, Israel prevailed. And whenever he lowered his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands grew weary. So they took a stone and put it under him and he sat on it. While Aaron and Hur held up his hands, one on one side and the other on the other side. Listen, so his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. And Joshua overwhelmed Amalek and his people with the sword. Then the Lord said to Moses, write this as a memorial in a book and recite it in the ears of Joshua that I will utterly blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven and Moses built an altar and called the name of it the Lord is my banner saying a hand upon the throne of the Lord the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation I want to put a simple tag on this text tonight. I just want to talk about victory in the valley. Victory in the valley. Israel is not long in the wilderness, having been newly delivered from Egypt by the hand of God. And now, having crossed the Red Sea by God's miraculous power, having been fed with miracle matzah, what is it, bread, manna? Having received water from a rock, Israel is now thrust unexpectedly, fresh off of the Exodus, into a season of struggle and war, where those who have only known to be slaves must now quickly learn how to be soldiers. Amalek is on the attack. Amalek, my brothers and sisters, are the children who are nation, the grandsons of Esau. They carry in them Esau's blood. Esau, that wild hunter, the hairy hunter who was the twin brother of Jacob, older and stronger is now seen his descendants come upon Israel, these who have been slaves, who've never fought before, now thrust into unexpected warfare, having just been delivered from Egypt. And it's something that the enemy doesn't let you breathe. 
when you're newly delivered. Behind every great blessing will be an unexpected battle. I need your help tonight. In fact, my brothers and sisters, I want to suggest to you that the greater the blessing, the more immediate, imminent, and significant the battle will be. And often, the battles that you and I must face and the enemies that you and I must fight are those who, from a natural point of view, are stronger, more experienced, greater than we are. It should have been a bloodbath. By all accounts, Israel is the underdog. By all accounts, Israel should have been soundly defeated. After all, they have no experience, no expertise in warfare. And yet the end of our text, the end of this particular tale, says to us that we don't see Israel slaughtered in the valley, but rather Israel stands victorious. These slaves made soldiers fighting an unexpected battle with uh, an, in, an enemy that's stronger than they are somehow come out victorious. My brothers and sisters, the victory that they experience is not because of some slick trick, or some plan, some, some ingenuity on the part of their leadership. No, rather they simply win because God is on their side. My brothers and my sisters, that is the simple truth of this text, the simple truth of this text is that when we feel overwhelmed by strong enemies, you and I can be assured of victory simply because the Lord is on our side. I'm saying to you, my brothers and my sisters, that you and I should expect opposition on our way to destiny. In fact, in fact, these Amalekites, my brothers and sisters, are residents of South Canaan. They are people who understand they are threatened by the potential of Israel. Please note, my friend, that they are not threatened by what Israel is. They are threatened by what Israel shall be. Isn't it interesting that sometimes the enemy has a greater view of your destiny than you have while, while you're still struggling with shaking off the mentality and the vestiges and the bitterness and the struggles of your Egypt experience, your, your, your enemy already sees you as potentially possessing the promises of God. And what the enemy wants to do is to get you in your immaturity because the enemy wants to kill you before you ever see who God intends for you to ultimately be. I, I, I want to talk here for just a minute and tell you the enemy is not after where you are and what you have because you're still in the wilderness. No, the enemy is after where you're going and what you shall have because the promise is on your life. And while you're still struggling to become and while you're still dealing with becoming and evolving and maturing, the enemy wants to get you now because if you can ever figure out who God really wants you to be. He knows he has no shot stopping you. These Amalekites are a fierce people, my brothers and sisters. In fact, Josephus, the Jewish historian, tells us, Dr. Parks, uh, that they were the most warlike nation in their whereabouts. They are ferocious. They are fierce, but they are also fearful, and they have arrayed themselves in battle to stop Israel in its immature state. But the end of the text is that Israel wins the victory against an enemy stronger than itself because God is on Israel's 
side. Now, my brothers and sisters, that's the whole sermon, and, and I could really sit down now, but the text has some particulars and some details that, that explain this issue of victory in life's valleys when we have to face stronger enemies, mightier enemies. In fact, the text suggests, my brothers and sisters, that it is victory given by God to the people of God as the people of God walk out and war in the will of God. And as the people of God understand how God provides victory, as they, as they understand, as they view God's process of victory, as they, as they come to learn, here's what the text is teaching us, what we, what we have to do when we understand that God is on our side to manifest the victory already promised. You're missing the good stuff. Let's try it another way. Uh, in other words, God wants to give you victory, but there is an attitude and some actions that you and I must adopt in order to walk in the victory that God wants to give us. Maybe I'm not at your seat yet, so let me try to make it more plain. You're going to have to fight when you get to the job tomorrow, and you're going to have to fight when the doctor tells you a negative diagnosis, and you're going to have to fight to keep the marriage together and you're going to have to fight your child being drawn away by the world and you're going to have to fight. I wish y'all would help me out in here when, when the enemy tries to take your mind and to take your peace and to take your joy and to rob you of the, of the privilege of the joy of your salvation. You're going to have to fight in order to maintain your sanity when the world is trying to make you go crazy. You're going to have to fight in order not to slap somebody who's getting on your last black nerve. I wish I had somebody would help me here. You're going to have to fight in order to stay spiritual when you want to backslide into your flesh and become who you used to be, who God delivered you out of. And you need to know how to act and what to think so that when those battles come, you can walk in victory that God already ordained. I'm going to feel better here in a minute. The text says that, that, we, that we adopt the right attitude and live in the right actions. When we understand, and here it is, initially, victory comes through proper positioning. That's the text. Amalek comes and fights with Israel, according to verse 8. They had Rephidim. And Moses said to Joshua, I want to talk to Joshua for a minute. Joshua, choose for us men. Go out and fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I'll stand on the top of the hill with the staff of God in my hand. So Joshua did <laughs> as Moses told him. Okay. Uh, now here's what you got to understand. There are, there's a leader and, and then, there, then, there's, then there's Joshua. And, 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 and we live in a day of, of, of massive misunderstanding regarding victory in our valleys because we don't know where leaders are supposed to be and where soldiers are supposed to be. Okay, so here it is. Joshua is in the valley. Moses is up on the hill. This is not because Moses is better than Joshua. No, in fact, my brothers and sisters, this is because Moses and Joshua at this time have different roles in the victory enterprise. Both roles are valid and valuable, but they can't be the same thing. Moses is up on the hill holding up the rod of God, and I'll deal with this more in a second, in the position of intercession. While the army is in the valley fighting their natural enemy, Moses is on the hill fighting their spiritual enemy. Now just because the leader is sitting without a sword doesn't mean the leader isn't fighting. Okay, okay, let me help you out with it. Because some of y'all aren't mad with Moses. But some of y'all get jealous of Aaron and her. 
because Joshua is in the valley. Moses is on the hill, and you're cool with that. But what you don't like is that Aaron and her get to go up on the hill with Moses while you got to sit down and fight in the valley. Uh, but, but don't be mad if you're not the closest to the leader now, Joshua. In fact, if I had time, if I had time, said I'd tell them that, that, that this is the Bible's first mention of Joshua. Joshua, who will be the successor of Moses, who's called Moses' minister, Moses' servant. The first time we meet Joshua, he and Moses don't seem to be that close. Um, present proximity to the leader uh, doesn't determine ultimate destiny. Wait a minute. High positions are often reserved for those who worked in low places. I wish I had strength to preach this. Joshua, watch the text. Watch the text, verse 10. Joshua did as Moses said. Your victory is determined by your ability to humble yourself and do what the leader says in low places while you are living with a high destiny. Wait a minute. A high anointing often has to function in a low place in order to be validated and you're not ready to lead until you've learned how to serve somewhere down in the valley. Joshua did, as Moses said. <laughs> and because, verse 10, first mention of Joshua, uh, he did as Moses said, we have an entire book in our Bible called Joshua. He's going to be the one who leads Israel into the promised land, a place that even Moses does not get to go because he did what Moses said. Wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. T, listen, uh, he, he's also going to be one of the first ones to taste the fruit of the promised land because he's one of the 12 spies Moses sends out in the book of Numbers. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to encourage you to do what Moses said. Wait a minute, wait a minute. He's also going to live to a ripe old age. Wait a minute. And he's going to share a name with and be one of the premier types of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, you do know that the name Jesus is just the Greek form of the Hebrew name Joshua. And in verse 10, we see a preview of the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ in that Joshua who is destined for leadership and glory humbles himself and fights in the valley. Isn't that what Jesus did when he left his throne in heaven, condescended through 42 generations, crossed the nine-month sea and got in the valley with us? Isn't that what Jesus did when leaving the royal praise of the angelic host of heaven he condescended into human status born through the womb of a virgin laid in a manger he just did what the father said when the father said love your enemy that's what Jesus did when he said father forgive them for they know not what they do when the father said give your life that's what Jesus did when he laid down with all of the power of heaven and earth at his disposal and let them nail his his hands and spike his feet and crowned him with thorns and gave up the ghost one dark Friday. He just did. Uh, when we first meet Joshua, he, he's not in charge and, and he's not even invited up on the hill. 
He's doing grunt work. I wish you could see the picture of, of Joshua looking up on the hill, seeing Moses and Aaron and her while he's stepping in blood and feces and smelling the stench of sweat and death all around him but he's faithful in the valley which is why he can be trusted on the mountain at a later time you're not hearing what I'm saying because when it came time for Moses to go up on the mountain to receive the Decalogue the Ten Commandments the person who is allowed to traverse with him peace of the way is the same Joshua who was not invited on the hill in this text I'm trying to help you live I'm saying the valley and the grit and the grime and the, and the dirt is not a bad place to be if that's where you're called to be for now. Let me, let me move quickly to tell you that this victory in the valley does not just come through proper positioning, but it comes by way of leadership support. Uh-huh. Let's try it another way. So this victory in the valley comes because Joshua understands his role in the valley while Aaron and her understand their role on the hill. So, so here's what happens. They get up there and, and Moses lifts up the rod and the rod is, is, is lifted not in one hand, in both hands. This is a position of intercession. In fact, all of the old uh, ancient scholars agree and, 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 and most of the modern scholars agree that, that this is the position of prayer. That he's holding up the rod, praying for the people. Because they are too weak to win without spiritual intervention. And that means say, New Hope, uh, you ought to thank God for a praying leader. And, 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 and. Cause I know you. I know you've been to school, perhaps, and I know you. You've been on your job a long time, and I know you special and you cute and you smart and you got all that. But the devil would whoop you if you didn't have a leader praying for you. Because as great as you think. You might be, the truth is, you and I are way too weak to ever win in life unless spiritual intervention is called for through spiritual intercession. Moses is praying for the folk. While his hands are up, Israel is winning. When his hands are lowered, the Bible says Amalek prevails. Verse 12 says something interesting, but Moses' hands grew weary. Y'all see that? His hands grew weary. His hands grew weary. Even strong leaders get weak arms. And here is, here is here's the thing. Uh, the valley is where the battle is in the natural. But, but the hill is where the spiritual warfare is going on. Now, now Aaron and her, Aaron is himself anointed. High, he is the high priest to be. He has been the spokesman for Moses in Egypt. And Aaron could have easily said, give me the rod. Let me hold it a while. I've learned, I've learned, Doc Parks, that some people are on the hill with you because they intend to catch the rod when you drop it. Some people are on the hill to take selfies in proximity with the rod. And, and they are there because they think the hill is the place to be validated and appreciated and celebrated. And they really aren't in love with you. They just want to be close to the rod. I wish y'all would help me out in here. They just want to be close to the rod because they think being close to the rod means being close to God. He could have said, give me the rod. Let me hold the rod. 
for a while. But Aaron and her at this time have sense enough to know the rod is not their responsibility. The leader is. I may not hoop tonight. I'm just trying to help you live. So what I'm trying to suggest to you, my brothers and sisters, is that if you're in a fight, you don't have time to be trying to question, doubt, deliberate with your leader. You got to find a way when it looks like he's getting weak, not to talk about him, not to, not to criticize him, not to find fault with him, but to get up under him so that he can keep his hands up because the victory is in his hands. Moses is weak. Moses is imperfect. Moses is flawed. Moses cannot continue in the constant work of intercession and prayer without some support from Aaron and her. And so here's what they do. They say, Moses, you've been standing by yourself long enough. Sit down. Wow. Here's what they do. They get up under his arms, which means if he's sitting, they can't be standing and supporting. If he's sitting, then they have to be lower. I'm trying to get you to victory. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get you to be able to handle your financial crisis. I'm, tr I'm trying to get you to be able to handle depression. I'm trying to get you to be able to handle whatever the devil is trying to throw your way. I'm saying that you need to stop seeing your leader as just another man. Though he is a man, he's not just another man. He's God's man who has the rod in his hand. And as long as his arms are lifted, you can get the victory. But if you let his arms drop, and I'm through now, I'm through. I, I'm through with it. But if his arms fall, it's your fault. I couldn't get no amens there. I, I said if his arms fall, it's your fault. It means you would not humble yourself. Low enough to get under to support the leader. Moses is weary. Moses is weak. Moses is trying to pray, but he can't pray now. And Aaron and her have enough sense to get low to support to hold up the arms of the leader. I'm through with it. I'm through with it. I'm through with it. But here's what you got to know. Rods get heavy. Leadership is more than a notion. Can I, let me make it more plain. Pastoring y'all. will make you tired. Somebody ought not let the man of God's hands fall. I'm through. I'm done. But, 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 but note, victory, my brothers and sisters, victory comes through proper positioning. Victory comes by way of leadership support. I'm through with it. But victory then is given for future reference. I'm through. I'm through. So the text says that, that his hands were steady <laughs> till the going down of the sun. And, and, and here, here's what it says. It says his hands were steady and, 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 and Joshua overwhelmed Amalek and his people with the sword. So they, they enjoyed the victory. You got it? Unexpected fight. Underdogs, no experience, 
but they get the victory. And, and watch the instruction. Moses, watch me. Watch it. You ready? Moses, write this down. I don't want you to forget this. I want you to write it down. I want you to write it down. And I, I want you to read it to Joshua. That this is, this is why Moses is an educated leader. Uh, they live in an illiterate culture. Don't have time to work on it. Um, Joshua, as a slave, probably cannot write the story himself. So Moses, educated in the Egyptian court of Pharaoh, having been the, the ward of Pharaoh's daughter, is equipped uniquely to, to, to write Joshua's story for Joshua so that later on Joshua won't forget it. Wait a minute. <laughs> uh -huh. uh, I want you to remind Joshua because this is not the last battle that Joshua is going to have to fight. Uh, they won today, but I need them to know that I'm going to be with them, not just in this battle, but in every battle, so that when they face a battle tomorrow, I don't need them scared and nervous and afraid, because you might not always be here for them to win, but when you give them this book, they'll have the testimony that it wasn't Moses who did it. Watch it. I'm through. Oh, here, here it is. God used Moses to intercede for the people. But, hey, here it is. It wasn't Moses that guaranteed the victory. Write this down. Don't forget, you saw Moses' hands. And you saw the rod. But it wasn't hands nor rod that healed you from cancer. I wish y'all would help me out in here. Because there may come a battle where you can't get in touch with Moses. There may come a battle where Moses is out of town or Moses is on vacation. There may come a battle where Moses is asleep and doesn't answer the phone. But you got to know who it was. Y'all not churchy enough. If, if y'all would have be churchy, I'll tell you, shake a neighbor's hand and say, don't forget who it was. <laughs> write, write it down. Write it down. So that Joshua does not forget it was the Lord. He calls his name Jehovah Nisi. Simply translated, the Lord is my banner. Now I know you don't know why to shout there. I'm going to say why you should have shouted and I'm going to my seat. Banners. This was not the battle flag. So many people misinterpret the Lord as my banner as though this is the flag you carry with you into battle. That's not what this is. This is not the battle flag. The banner is the banner of victory. <laughs> Watch me. You only raised Nisi after the enemy had been defeated. I'm through now. I tried my best. I I'm trying to say to you tonight that, that the Lord being your banner means the omnipotent and omnipresent God who is with you assures that any enemy you have to fight has already I'm done. already been defeated so so that you and I don't fight for the victory we fight from the victory I'm not fighting trying to see what the end is going to be. I'm fighting because I know that whatever I'm facing right now, God has already assured me that the battle been fought. Victory has been won. Would you shake somebody's hand and say, neighbor, I came tonight 
with my banner with me. I may still have to fight sometimes, but I do not find uh, wondering how uh, things are going to turn out. I, I already know the Lord has given me the victory. Would you shake that hand one more time and say, neighbor, tell me who can stand before us when, when we call on that great name. Do I have any helpers tonight? And I heard the old saints used to sing I was alone and idle I was a sinner too but I heard a voice from heaven saying there is work to do I took my master's hand and I joined the Christian band and I'm all the battlefield for my Lord. Is there anybody here that's on the battlefield? Storms may rise, but you're going to keep on fighting. Winds may blow, but you're going to keep on fighting. Friends may walk away, but keep on fighting. Sick in your body, but keep on fighting. Money gets funny, but keep on fighting because the promise of God is if you keep on fighting soon and after a while, he'll give you the victory. Do I have a witness here? We got to go tonight, y'all, but can I borrow your hand just one more time? Can I borrow your hand just one more time would you do me a favor please would you turn and take a neighbor's hand look at him in their face and say neighbor I may be in the valley I may be fighting against Amalek but I will not fear I am not afraid it may be bigger than me it may be stronger than me, but I've got the Lord on my side. And I, I, I got somebody who will fight with me. Do I have any helpers here? And I don't know what you got to go through. I don't know what you gotta face tomorrow I don't know what you gotta deal with when you get home tonight but I got good news for you the Lord is your banner is there anybody here that knows you already got the victory well if you know You've already got it. Why don't you act like it right now? Don't wait until the battle is over. Shout now. I said shout now. Yeah. to get out of here. I wish I had strength to preach like I feel it. I wish I could do in my body what I feel in my heart. I need to borrow you one more time. I need you to put your arm around somebody and encourage them tonight and say you may have to fight but tell them maybe if you have to fight don't you worry and don't you fret 
dismayed in fact be not dismayed whatever be tied God will take care of you beneath his wings of love abide he will he will he will Yeah. 